I'd like you to turn to John chapter 14. We're also going to go to uh, Jeremiah, and then we're going to jump to um, a portion of Luke and a portion of Matthew. Uh, and hopefully Warren can drive the bus down there so we get the scriptures come up. Um, we're in the midst of a series of messages that I've entitled with a theme, The Kingdom of God. And it is intended to set before us and to stir us up to consider God has this figured out. Oh, sorry, with regards to Sunday school, there was a mix-up to stay in. <laughs> uh, the scheduling thing didn't work properly. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, it's nobody's fault but mine. So, um, the kingdom of God, it's not merely a topic. It is rather a phrase that describes God's brilliant, perfect, like, what, what word is sufficient to describe the brilliant wisdom of God in dealing with the whole problem that we find ourselves in that is the result of sin? Okay? What is the plan of it? It's not like God was taken by surprise when Adam and Eve sinned and that as a result of that, Every human being has suffered. All of the suffering in the world is not because of God. It is not because of God. All the suffering through the ages and through our own time on earth is not because of God. It is the consequence of rebellion against God that God has a brilliant plan to restore. And the phrase, the kingdom of God, we can use as a shorthand that describes that overall thing. And there are, as I've said to you before, many, many threads in this theme called the kingdom of God that God brilliantly brings together to bring about the perfect solution that he has in his heart and mind. And that's what we have been granted the privilege of being involved with. Okay? And last week I talked to you about one aspect of this. To set the stage again, especially if you didn't hear last week's message, part of the plan of God involved choosing a man named Abram who was commanded to leave where he was living and to leave his father's house and to leave his country. In other words, everything he was familiar with and just on the grounds that God had spoken to him, he was to go to a land that God was going to show him. Now, nothing special about Abram. Okay? He was just a guy. Nothing the most holiest man in the land or nothing like that that we have any record of. But God had in his heart a plan. And that plan, if we read the promise in Genesis chapter 12, was not just for the man named Abram. It was for, with a view to blessing all the families of the earth. Okay? Now from Abram was descended a, a man named Isaac. Abram and his wife Sarah could not have children. Um, and Isaac was born as a result of the faithfulness of God because God made him a promise. From Isaac came a man named Jacob. Okay? They had more children than this, but Jacob is the significant one. And from Jacob was descended the whole nation called Israel. And God made promises to Israel. It's like the plan of God to put everything back on track involved this nation of people called Israel. Israel was given certain promises, particularly that there would be coming in the line of Israel someone who would rule all the earth and bring about peace and justice. My short form of it. Okay? And there were specific characteristics about him. He was going to be descended from King David. He was going to do certain things. And all the promises that God made to Israel were going to be fulfilled through this one coming, the Messiah. Okay? And the promises that God made to the nation of Israel were centered around the land that Israel was occupying. Okay? God made a promise to them. This land I will give to you and to your descendants forever. So all of the things that Israel understood were involved being in the land that God had made. Okay? Well, fast forward, the Messiah comes. He doesn't do what everybody thinks he's supposed to do, which was, amongst other things, kick the Romans out. 
Okay? Remember, he came at a time when Rome, the empire of Rome, dominated the land of Israel, the land of Judah, and, um, and, and where, where the people of Israel lived at that time. They were brutal. They were not enlightened rulers. They were a brutal nation, and they dominated Israel, and the, and the nation of Israel hated it. They hated it. So one of the things they were expecting when it became apparent this Jesus guy, he does miracles. He, nobody talks like him. Everything like, follows to his authority. He tells the demons to go, they get out. This is the guy, this is the guy. So that, of course, meant this is the guy that's going to kick Rome out, and he's going to give the kingdom back to Israel. Okay? There were times in Jesus' ministry when the people got so excited about what he did was they wanted to come and take him and make him king by force. And he wouldn't have anything to do with it. So there was a little problem. The Messiah wasn't behaving as the Messiah was supposed to behave, according to the people of Israel. And in the end, they rejected him. And they allowed him to be crucified. Now, it probably escaped their notice, but that was actually fulfilling what God said would happen to him. Because even though Israel was caught up with the message that God had given to them, the plan of God involves much more than just the nation of Israel. And this is something that is important for us to understand. So much of the Older Testament, another way to write that or speak about that is the Older Covenant, was focused on what was God going to do for Israel and therefore through Israel. Okay? The small problem of Israel rejecting their Messiah didn't dawn on them, of course we're going to serve God. That's what they always said. Okay? God makes a covenant from the very beginning. He says, okay, here's my part, here's your part. I'll do my part, you do your part. This is my response to it. If you don't do your part, then this is my response to that. You need to serve the Lord with all your heart. Oh, yes, we'll serve the Lord and nobody else. How many times did that happen in the history of Israel? And God knew it all. It's not like he was surprised. Okay, this time they're going to serve me. Oh, they did it again. That's not God. That's not God. It did not take him by surprise that people behaved as they did. So, when they rejected the Messiah, it's not like God stopped and said, we've got to come up with a new plan. Rather, something that was always part of the plan started to come to be unfolded. And that is the time of the church. Okay? Now, I bring all of this up to say how we understand these things and how we understand the things that are yet to come depend on what you think about these things. There are many believers who believe that because Israel, the nation of Israel, rejected Jesus, the church just takes over from Israel. And all the promises made to Israel, you're going to rule, uh, people are going to bow down before you, the king is going to reign, that now applies to the church. Okay? It's like God said, well, you guys are idiots, so I'm going to give it to somebody else who doesn't deserve it either, but at least you know, they're, they're part of mine. I'm going to make a people who are not my people, my people. Okay? And the problem with that is it opens the door for you to remain completely confused about other things that he says. So one of the things I wanted to get across last week was how you think about what are the scriptures? How do we handle them? How do you approach them? It matters if you want to understand what God is unfolding for us. And the main reason we want to understand it is it gives us courage for the day we're in today. You know, um, I think many people think we're very close to the end of all things, and that very well could be the case. But you and I don't know that for sure. You and I don't know that Jesus is not going to uh, wait even longer bef until, you know, like we, we die before he comes. We don't know that, right? We don't know that. So in the time that we live, it may or may not be the case that some of these things are fulfilled. But whatever God has said is intended to give us courage today. Our seeing the faithfulness of God and the brilliance of God is intended for us to see today. So then I got no problem here. If he's got this grand story figured out and is masterfully bringing things together the way he said he would, 
How am I a problem? How is anything I'm going through a match with the kindness and the goodness of God? It also, as we've already talked, gives us a place to represent Him more faithfully. Okay? So last week I took some time to make a distinction. I said, I think the way we should approach Scripture is that we should treat it as being literally true. All of it is literally true, meaning what God is trying to say in the words that he's using is true. He may use figurative language to paint a picture, but the message is still true. Okay? So I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Jesus used a parable, and he said, which one of you, if you have a sheep and is lost on the Sabbath, would not leave your 99 safe and go look for that sheep? Right? What was he doing? Was he saying, you actually are sheep? Yes, you look like a human, but you're a sheep. No, he's painting a picture. Right? The literal truth of what he's talking about is God is a good shepherd who will go after you and rescue you. It does not mean you're a sheep. The scriptures talk about in Psalm 91, for example, um, that you can run for refuge under his wings. That does not mean God is a bird. Right? It is painting a picture. So there are places, many places, where he uses figurative language. So we're not saying that you have to take every word literally and that's all there is. But the truth of it, you have to take literally. And secondly, when it comes to approaching scripture, let it say what it says. Where it's figurative, okay, we look for that. But don't turn things, so don't turn a promise concerning the land into something that doesn't involve land. We should treat scriptures as God saying what he means to say there. So when he promises to the la people of Israel, and that's what we're going to read just in a moment, um, promises concerning the land, then say, there are promises concerning the land. They may not be fulfilled yet. Fine. But if he says land, then he meant land, not heaven. Okay? So let me uh, do that now. John, uh, before we do that, let me pray. Having set the stage here, Father, we just invite you to come and have your way among us. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to teach us and to bring us into the truth as Jesus promised you would. And so we're asking for hearts that are teachable. We're asking for ears, the ears of a disciple, to be open to hear you. And so, Father, where we are caught, where we are trapped by our own presumptuous thinking or by our own strong opinions, please help us there so that we can hear what you are saying. I ask for utterance in the opening of my mouth and at the same time that you would set a guard over it. The best of my opinions are worthless, but the smallest thing you have to say is life. And so we ask you to help us to hear what you have to say to us today. Blow away and make of no effect what is merely the opinions of a man or of men and women, but rather what you say capture us by it so that we might live in the confidence and the courage that is the inheritance of those who have put their trust in Jesus. We just thank you, Father, for loving us perfectly. Amen. Okay, so if you turn to John chapter 14. This is a recap from last week. Do not let your heart, verse 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Okay? So this is what he said to his disciples. I'd like you to go back to Jeremiah. I've just chosen this. There are so many passages that we could choose to show this reality that God has made promises to Israel and part of those promises center upon land, a nation ruling on the earth. Okay? So in Jeremiah chapter, let's start in chapter 30. In verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write all the books which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, 
Days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. Okay? That was written in a time when God was saying, you are about to be scattered because of your disobedience. And he tells them, I will bring them back to this land. Okay? In Jer Jeremiah chapter 31, towards the end, in verse 35, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moons and the stars for light by night, who stir up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched up below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Okay? So I'd just like to draw your attention to here again is another promise. Okay? Despite their disobedience, despite the fact that they deserve God abandoning them, he still sticks to the promise. He is faithful to the promise he made first to Abram and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and all the way through. Okay? And I draw again your attention that that promise involves a land. But to the church, what did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. As I said to you last week, where did he go? Did he go to North America? Did he go to Africa? Did he go to Asia, maybe? What was he talking about? He was going to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. So the promise that he makes in view of Israel having rejected um, their Messiah, in view of all the things that had unfolded, and it's a pretty dramatic time right there. He's called the Pharisees and the scribes, the people who were the experts and the people who would lead Israel spiritually. He's called them whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. He, he, he just rips a strip off of them, to use a figure of speech. He is really, really, really upset with them. Because he said, you won't enter the kingdom of God, and you prevent others from doing so. So he's really upset with them. And uh, has, he has told his disciples, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. And the disciples don't know what to do with that because, no, wait, you're supposed to restore the kingdom to Israel and you're going to die? How does that work? That, that doesn't make any sense. But Jesus is Jesus, so they don't bring up a big discussion there. And here he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Again, I draw your attention to this. The nature of the promise made to Israel is different than the nature of the promises made to the church. They are not the same. Even if we have sincere brethren who are open to that way of thinking. If we let the scriptures be the scriptures, then, meaning if we let the scriptures alone and take their va the words at plain value, God has made a set of promises to Israel that are different. There's some overlap, yes, but they are different in character than the promises he's made to the church. So we cannot conclude they're just the same thing. It's just Israel now becomes the church. You know, there's a passage that talks about the Israel of God. Actually, it's not talking about the church. There's a difference, okay? It matters, it matters, okay? Why does it matter? Well, the things that are about to unfold involve God's plan and purpose in both Israel but also in the church. And we need to understand what is it that applies to us? What are we being called to do? What is our assignment in this time? How do we manage these things? Also, if you don't have... Um, some groundwork in place, then, you know, when you start reading the book of the Revelation, all you can get is confused. What on earth is this talking about? Like, this is wild. And you have no basis because everything becomes all jumbled. So hopefully, by doing a little bit of this work now, we set the stage for us to be able to handle the book of the Revelation or the passages in Daniel, okay? So the first thing I wanted to say and emphasize and finish with is the church is not Israel. There are separate promises. There are separate 
programs in place for both. And if we understand that and approach the scriptures as, well, let's just take God at face value, what he says there, um, then it's much easier to understand the overall revelation. Okay? So then let's move, take another step. One of the challenges in working with prophecy is that prophecy doesn't work like everyday stuff. Okay? So if I say, I'm going to the store, I'm going to buy some milk, then I'm going to the hardware store, I'm going to get this, and I'm going to come back home. Okay? If I say something like that, my wife will probably assume, okay, he'll be gone about an hour. Okay? Because he's going to the store, he's going to buy milk, he's going to the hardware store, he's coming back. Okay? The way things unfold for us on a normal level is in a sequence, and from that, you know, our experience, we can say, okay, that's going to take about an hour. The problem with prophecy is you can have things that are fulfilled immediately side by side with things that are fulfilled far in the future. And if you aren't aware that this is how prophecy works, it can lead to confusion. So I'll give you an example of this so I can um, illustrate it for you. If you go to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, not Mark. In verse 14, he says, And Jesus returned to Galilee, and the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues, and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as it was his custom... He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Okay? He reads a prophecy from the book of Isaiah, and he says, Today, this has been fulfilled. Let's go and find the place in Isaiah where this is referring to. Okay? So jump back to Isaiah chapter 61. Okay, so this is one of the characteristics of how God does things. He uses people, and he uses them to speak what is, um, what God is thinking about what's going on now, yes, but also what is going to happen, okay? This is just a sign of God being who he is. And in Isaiah 61, this is what is recorded. So this is Isaiah, I think it was written about 600 years before Jesus showed up. Okay, something like that. I have, might have the timing wrong. But it is hundreds of years before Jesus shows up. It's not written when Jesus showed up. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations, Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks, and foreigners will be your farmers and your wine, vine dressers. But you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. 
Instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. I'll stop there. Okay? So, what prophecy did Jesus read? He read Isaiah 61. But did you notice, a lot of what we just read did not just get fulfilled. Why is that? Does that mean we can pick and choose which parts of prophecy we like and the rest doesn't have to count? No. I would like to say, if we treat this literally, this is going to happen. Part of it already did. But the rest remains. But it's side by side. If you don't know that the way a prophet sees things can involve seeing things that are immediately close, but also things in the future. Like, I don't know how many people here have gone to the mountains. Like, let's say you go to Barrier Lake, for example, which is something that we sometimes do. And you're sitting right by the lake. And you look, and you see the lake in front of you. And if you raise your eyes a little bit more, you see the mountain behind it. And depending on where you're located, if you raise your eyes even more, you see mountains behind that and behind that. So which is the true picture? There is a lake, and that's all? Well, from one perspective, yeah, there's a lake. That's all there is. But the fuller perspective sees the lake, the mountain behind, the mountains behind that, the mountains behind that. Like if you go to like, you know, to the top of a mountain, if you climb and you look around you, you don't just see the mountain you're on. You see all of these things yet to come. Well, prophecy is kind of like that. He gives you a glimpse of what is now and what is yet to come. And it takes some discernment to see where does this stop. Did you notice Jesus stopped at the place where what had been fulfilled was fulfilled? He didn't say, and all of this is fulfilled. Right? He stopped there. Does that mean the rest of it doesn't count? No, it's going to happen. Remember, God has made promises to the people of Israel about land and a kingdom and how that's going to work. And Jesus took a portion that did apply now, said it did, and said, here we are. But he did not go into the next step because it wasn't about to be fulfilled. All I'm trying to show you is prophecy. One of the things about it, it can have things that are due now and things that are later. You'll see the same thing if you go and read what Peter's response is on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and they all start speaking in a different language and everybody around says, oh, these guys are just drunk which to me never made sense. Drunk people talk in a different language. When does that ever happen? In a language that they don't know. How does that ever happen? How, how do you conclude they're drunk? Anyway, the point is, Peter then stands up and he quotes a prophecy from the book of Joel that describes part of it. I will pour out my spirit on everybody. Then it talks about the moon turning red. Well, that didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. The moon didn't turn red. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is, when it comes to prophecy, just remember, God is crazy. Now, people know not to say that, but their general approach to Scripture leaves them in a place where they have to conclude, you just never know with God. It's just so confusing. Actually, it's not as confusing as you might imagine if you recognize how God does certain things. Okay? I am not trying to imply to you just come and listen to me. I'll explain it all to you. I am not in that place. Holy Spirit is the only one who has that place. But I am saying to you, it is not as make it up as you go, as you might imagine. There is a way. There is a rule. When God says something, it will all come to pass. So with that said, let's end by going to Matthew chapter 24. Okay. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole passage. Can I ask you to read this section, Luke chapter 24? Uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 24, 25, and yeah, 25 will do. And then there's a parallel passage in Mark and in Luke. Luke is in Luke chapter 21. Mark, I have to go and find it for you. Um, but just have a read of it. And all I'm asking you to do is, having read it, at least you know some of the things that it's talking about. So we have a frame of reference, okay? Actually, read from Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, 
How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate, for I say to you from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus came out from the temple and was going up away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay? What did they ask him? Tell us, when will these things happen, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that you, no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdoms against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all of these things are merely the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pangs. I want to jump ahead to, what's that? Matthew chapter 24. Uh, did I say, no, I jumped to Matthew 23 verse 37 to start, and then it just continued, yeah, and then I just continued to 24. Yeah, apologize, I'm making it hard for Warren who doesn't normally drive back there. Uh, 24 chapter, we were, chap I was reading from Matthew chapter 24 verse 1, but don't bother putting it up, okay? So I'd like you to read this because he's talking about what? What is the question that he is answering? Well, it's Jesus. He just talks about stuff. Like, you know, you never know really what's going on. No, he actually is answering the questions that were asked, okay? What did the disciples ask him? They were struck by Jesus saying, Every stone here that you see in these temples, not one of them is going to remain on top of each other, okay? Which is an extraordinary thing. I read an illustration about that. You know, when Abram went to Egypt, the uh, Pyramid of Giza would have been about 2,000 years old at that time, okay? Massive structure built with massive blocks. It's still standing today, okay? Even though, what, 5,000 years has passed? 6,000 years has passed since it was built, it's still standing today, okay? So it's not like time just breaks things down. In, in, in Central America, there are pyramids that the people of that time built, still standing today, still standing today. Jesus makes a prediction, a prophecy, about a building that was made with massive blocks. It wasn't like little bricks that we might put together. A massive thing that just stood and had stood for Many years. And he says, not one block is going to be left on top of the other. So then the, pro the disciples say, hey, like, when is this going to happen? And while they're at it, what are the signs of the end of the age and when you're going to come? Okay? So his dialogue here is answering those three questions. But he doesn't just necessarily do it in a straightforward fashion, in the sense of A, B, C. He sets the stage for things. He sets the stage for things, and we'll have to, I'm going to stop here. We're going to have to work also with passage from Luke. But what I can tell you is this. You know, him saying something like this would be for us to say something like, I don't know if you've ever been to New York, okay, or seen pictures of New York. Uh, before 2001, there were these two massive skyscrapers. They were amongst the very tallest buildings in the world, and they were a landmark in New York. And if you see movies from before 2000, if, you're, if you lived before 2000, <laughs> um, you'll see these buildings, and they stand out as a landmark. And if you were to be told, you know, that whole thing is going to be collapsing in a day, you'd probably laugh at it. Okay? That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened in September, 9th, 2000, September 11th, 2001. Right? Those two massive buildings came tumbling down. 
I'm trying to paint to you a picture of how absolutely ridiculous it would be for Jesus to say, not one stone is going to be left on the other. Okay? Well, this is roughly A.D. 33. So in 47 years, no, 37 years, 37 years after Jesus said that, exactly that happened. There was a rebellion in Israel against the kingdom of Rome, and Rome finally had it. These guys were just troublemakers. So Rome sent a massive army, surrounded Jerusalem, and destroyed it. Not one stone of the temple was left on top of the other. Not one stone of the temple was left on top of the other. So in AD 70, what Jesus said came to pass. Okay. But he ties those things to him coming again. And there are people who will say, therefore, Jesus' second coming also happened in AD 70. Uh, that doesn't make any sense because nothing else has been fulfilled. What I'm trying to illustrate to you again is here is prophecy and how it works. Part of it came to pass, but there remains something yet to come to pass. And one of the effects of this is to, for you to say, look, if this much came to pass, then he's got the fig rest of it figured out. Not, well, this came to pass, I don't know how it works. It is a sign. What he said is going to happen. What he said is going to happen. You are called to live your life today in 2024 on the grounds of what he said is going to happen. What he says happens. This is the entire grounding for faith. God is building for us the platform for us to confidently say everything God says, he will do. So that you personally have confidence. And we'll work from here. Again, if I could ask you to read Matthew chapter 24, 25, and, and also Luke chapter 21. I'll put the, the notes in signal, um, and we can pick it up next week. But he's talking about... Um, he himself is saying, here's how things are going to unfold. It's not the only passage that talks about things yet to come, but it sets the stage. And these things lace together. And if we want to get a picture of how the grander plan of God unfolds, we have to work with these things. I'm asking you to resist the temptation to say, eh, this is, not, this is all too complicated for me. Resist it. It was written for you. Okay? It was written for you and for me. And God has no problem with you. But you have to learn to say, I'm not going to accept being confused. Because that's just not normal in the Lord. It's not normal for a Christian to be confused about what God requires of them, what God, how God wants them to live. It's not normal. It happens, of course, because of who we are and what we're like. But it's not normal. And one of the things that, therefore, you have to do is... As he said, pray, ask. If any man asks wisdom, if any woman asks me for wisdom, I'll give it without reproach. I won't say, why are you asking me for this? Don't you already know? He will not say that. He will not say, you should know this by now. He will not. He will not deal with you as you and I might deal with one another. You should know this by now. Are you stupid? That's not how he deals with us. But he said, ask. Paul wrote, I pray that he would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. It's normal. It's, it's not normal just to read it and bang, everything makes sense to you. You need to pursue the Lord, and I'm asking you to do that. Okay? It may or may not be what interests you. <coughs> Prophecies concerning the end time. I understand that. We have busy lives and we got stuff going on, but let me again remind you, these things about what is yet to come and your grasp of them is to strengthen you for today. It's to strengthen you for the complicated, challenging places where you've got to believe the Lord today. So let's work together with Him. Let's let Him take us through this and put our feet on solid ground. Not merely to win arguments with people who might disagree with us. That's irrelevant when all is said and done. But that you might, A, faithfully serve him today, and B, with confidence, look forward to the future. Yes, the world is in uproar. I don't know, I'm not sure if you noticed. The world is in an uproar. Guess what? He talked about this. Psalm 2. 
Why are the nations in an uproar? Why are the kingdoms raging? Well, they're gathered against him. But it's okay. He's going to bring things about the way he wants. And this is to build confidence in us. Okay? So I'll leave, leave things there until we have a chance to continue from here. Again, your homework, please do take a moment, more than a moment, a few minutes to read Matthew 24, 25, and Luke chapter 21, and the parallel dialogue in Mark that he talks about this particular set of events. And we'll pick it up from there as we go from there. Okay? Father, again, we just commit our time and ourselves back into your hands. Now I ask you to win us over to the truth. Open the eyes of our hearts. Let us behold wonderful things from your law, from your word. And fill us. Holy Spirit, teach us. You make us adequate for the time that we live, for the circumstances that we live in. You make us adequate for these days. And so we present ourselves and ask you to lead us in. Take us in into all that is ours because of Jesus. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.